I believe you and I are being plunged in a, into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history. And we discover that every detail is there deliberately crafted. That we are beneficiaries of a love letter that was written in blood on a wooden cross 2,000 years ago. And we should not be blinded by the politically correct propaganda. That, and the more you know about your Bible, the more it's going to change your personal priorities about what you do in the days ahead. The topic that I thought I would select may sound very provincial to you, but I think you'll, upon some reflection, realize that it impacts all of us, not just us in America, and that's the American challenge. Because what happens in the United States, unfortunately, impacts everybody on the planet Earth one way or another. As we travel, there are two questions that we get asked uh, most frequently. The first one is, where is the United States in prophecy? Now, there are a number of books published with various conjectures. I've been through most of them, and uh, I find I'm underwhelmed by the arguments. I don't find, from my, as diligent as I've been studying the Scripture, I don't find the United States expressly identified. All the other players seem to be. And uh, yes, we're in there allegorically. Hosea 4 through 14 lays it out. Isaiah chapter 5 lays it out. But that's really in an allegorical or metaphorical way. Everybody that studies the scripture recognizes that the United States is conspicuous by its absence of mention, even though it's a major world power today. But the other thing, the other question that gets asked frequently is a close cousin of the first one. Why hasn't God judged America? Billy Graham quipped many years ago that uh, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> and that sort of captures the flavor of what we're talking about. It, uh, the United States has become the primary exporter of everything God abhors. And the way we answer that second question, typically, most of us, is because of Genesis 12, verse 2 and 3. Where God commits himself, I'll bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. In other words, the descendants of Abraham. And the United States, we believe, has been sheltered from an overdue judgment by its commitment, clumsy at best, in standing up for Israel's right to exist. And despite all our failures and fumblings and uh, uh, what have you, uh, we have remained their primary ally. Uh, and so that's our refuge. Now people say, aren't you worried about Israel? No, I'm not. I read the scripture. I looked ahead. They win. <laughs> <laughs> they are God's problem, not mine. I pray for them because I'm instructed to. But I don't worry because he that keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And there's plenty of other similar verses. I do worry about America because as I watch Condoleezza Rice and George Bush meddle in the Middle East, I'm very sensitive to the fact that God has a great deal to say about those that would dare to partition His land. And so as they continue to meddle in that area, I worry about the end of the U.S. for any of several reasons. Thomas Jefferson said the same thing back in 1781. He says, I tremble for my country when I recall that God is just and that His justice will not sleep forever. So. Back in 1770, Sir William Pitt introduced something into our language. He said of Britain and Britain's House of Lords, he said, There is something behind the throne greater than the king himself. And from that day on, that idiom is used widely in our literature. The power behind the throne. Even Fra Felix Frankfurt, a U.S. Supreme Court judge, hardly a conspiracy theorist, he said the real rulers in Washington are invisible, and they exercise power from behind the scenes. So the people that you see in the front are simply figureheads. The real power is behind the scenes. And at least in a, several of the administrations I'm familiar with, that power is the most sinister, most powerful crime syndicate in our history. We need to understand that. And um, there were over 100 murders covering up the Vince Foster murder during those Clinton years. The Secretary of Commerce, not only was he murdered, but everybody in the plane with him was taken down because he was going to turn evidence. William Colby, the head of CIA, 
Admiral Jeremy Borda, Chief of Naval Operations. The list goes on and on and on, the people that suffered mysterious circumstances. Sinister times. Sinister times. Lately, the European Union is being revisited by some analysts. You may recall back in 1951, a couple of socialists, John Monet and uh, Robert Schuman, founded an unusual organization called the European Coal and Steel Community. And it was to better trade relations. It was, they created a multinational organization that involved six countries, and they formed a very unusual entity called the European Coal and Steel Community, and they put the control of that in a thing they called the High Authority. That was so successful and innovative, it became the model for a treaty that followed in 1958. In 57, it was written, it took effect January 58, the Treaty of Rome, which created two more entities similar, the European Atomic Energy Community and the European Economic Community. And in 1967, within 10 years, it was, they all merged into one. So the three executive arms of those three organizations became one, and that became the European community. In 1993, the Master's Treaty superseded all of those. And I had the privilege of traveling with Admiral Middendorf, our ambassador to the EC, um, and uh, uh, we interviewed 40 of the top leaders. And we were, got firsthand exposure to the chicanery and the, the, uh, the, the games that were played to slip Master's tr through their various regimes to get it in place. And it, of course, transformed the, all the previous into what we know today as the European Union. And they tried many times to create a constitution unsuccessfully until 2007 with the Treaty of Lisbon, which replaces the need for a constitution, interestingly enough. It removes the central government from any accountability of the people. It establishes a common foreign policy and a common military. So the dreams of the founders has, have been achieved. Now, the European Commission made the mistake in 1990 of issuing a statement to that effect. So we see then that the institution set up since 1950 on the initiative of Robert Schuman and John Monet, but they're responding well to the aim of the founders. And that caused a number of editorials to come gushing forth because they felt that they had been hoodwinked, and indeed they were. Um, Worsthorn in the uh, Sunday Telegraph in London said, 20 years ago when the process began, there was no question of losing sovereignty. That was a lie or at any rate a dishonest obfuscation. I'm sorry, they were just asleep. There were many people that recognized the path they were on was to erode the sovereignty of the individual members. And there were a lot of editorials in those days. But in any case, nobody listened. And now they wake up to the fact that they're part of a, a non-accountable uh, uh, central bureaucracy. So what's the next step? To clone the EU in the Western Hemisphere. And the North American Free Trade uh, Agreement was the first step at that. And there have been some others tried in Central America. They've been stymied, fortunately, for a while uh, to get a free trade of all the Americas. Newt Gingrich tried to warn what was going on with the World Trade Organization. 70,000 page document passed by our Congress. No one read that. No one bothered to read it, believe it or not. One may have. Anyway, Newt Gingrich tried to warn what was going on here, and no one really listened. Robert Pastor is a director of the Council for Foreign Relations, and he has published openly what their concepts are. He points out that NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Association uh, Agreement, was simply the first draft of an economic constitution for all of North America. He regards the concept of sovereignty as obsolete. He sees the necessity for Canada, the United States, and Mexico to be combined into one. And he has the whole idea of establishing a North American Union is his goal. And he has a whole set of procedures to, that he suggests to do that. Now, NAFTA was established on the 1st of January of 1994. It's the largest free trade, it's the world's largest free trade area, which includes U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Why? Well, the goal was to create hundreds of thousands of new jobs. Doesn't that sound good? To raise the standard of living of all three nations? Really? And to improve the environment? Well, what's been the record of this? Several studies have concluded that NAFTA has destroyed hundreds of thousands of agricultural jobs in Mexico. That's one reason we have everybody trying to move north. 
The influx of imports has lowered the prices of Mexican corn by 70% since 1994. As a result, 15 million Mexicans who depend on the crop can no longer afford basic health care and have to work more to, uh, to do what they originally did. And so NAFTA has been criticized for allowing the U.S. agricultural subsidies to artificially depress corn prices. In the year 2000, the U.S. government subsidies in the corn sector totaled 10, over $10 billion, a figure 10 times the entire Mexican agricultural budget that year. It's been a disaster. 